Bruce McCandless III, and he grew up in El Lago, Texas during the Apollo and Skylab eras. He graduated from the Plan 2 Honors Program of the University of Texas in 1983 and went on to earn degrees from the University of Reading in England and the University of Texas School of Law. After teaching at St. David's School in New York City, he returned to Austin to practice law. He is the author of Sour Lake, Beatrice and the Basilisk, and with his daughter Carson, Carson Clare's Trail Guide to Avoiding Death. Bruce serves on the board of directors of the Worthy Garden Club, an Oregon-based environmental organization, and the Austin Public Library Foundation. He and his wife, Patricia Fuller McCandless, live in Austin. Welcome to the Reading Circle Microphones, none other than Bruce McCandless III. Bruce, good morning. Good morning, Mark. How are you? You know, like I told you, now that I hear your voice and now that we're on the air together, even better than I was when I got into the studio. <laughs> okay. Yeah, very good. It's, a, it's an early interview, for sure. It is. And, you know, and at one point, and you're on the East Coast. Like, I think you're, are you East Coast or are you Central Time? Uh, we're Central Time. You're Central. So you're an hour behind me. So, okay, so it's 6.05, your time. Well, at one, t- at one point in time, my guests a- appeared at 6 o'clock in the morning, my time. So it would have been 5 o'clock, your time. A few years ago, we bumped it up to 7 o'clock. So, it- <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and so I am thrilled uh, to have you here and talk to you here. Whenever the publishing company reached out to me, and because I'm an AV geek, I was immediately intrigued and we originally i had sent them a couple other dates and then i think they changed uh the persons who was managing the the account and they didn't see my email so the original dates that i gave they had never seen and they emailed me back and said do you have any i was like sure and as it turns out today was open i said do you think he can do i know it's short notice but do you think he can do this saturday and they were like yeah we think we can do that so that's from listening audience that's how the interview came about but as you can tell yeah. i'm hyped uh, I'm Good. looking forward to having this interview, having the chance to speak with Bruce McCandless III. So I tell you what, normally where I start with my authors is where did the whole thing of writing, you know, come from? What what made you become an author? And, so, and I know you're a combination of things in terms of being a lawyer, a poet, and a novelist. So I'm going to, since this one is, is a little bit different and is special in terms of you are now being the son of an astronaut and only not only an astronaut but the astronaut that's photographed untethered what for, let's so off for you i'm going to start with like what was it like you know as a child being the son of somebody who worked at nasa and not only worked at nasa but was an astronaut well so there's a couple of uh, a couple of ways to answer that you know where i grew up around the space center down in houston um the, the entire community basically was uh, was working for for NASA. You know, uh, there were some astronauts, but there were uh, there were lots and lots of engineers and technicians and and uh, and their kids and, and and our dads all did the same thing as far as we were concerned. That their their focus was uh, the Apollo program at the time. This is the you know late sixties, early seventies, and and uh, and getting uh, a man to the moon and and, and safely back home. So. So th- there wasn't anything uh, particularly um, special there about uh, about you know one's dad being being an astronaut. In fact, uh, you know my friends had uh, had dads who were the famous astronauts. You know the the, uh, the, the the Conrads and the Armstrongs and the Hayses. And so um, so so it, it really didn't feel uh, like anything significant. It's only only when I moved out into the world that occasionally I would meet someone and say, hey. Your dad was an astronaut. I'm a I'm a space fan. I, I, what was it like? And and so so I, I really only achieved that. I really only attained that sense of, of uh, there was something special and significant there um, later in, later in life. And you know that is yeah. that is fascinating to me from the standpoint of for you that was your norm. So what you're saying is it didn't really phase us because that's what we all were doing. Uh, but yet, exactly. like you said, for folks in the outside world, because 
the Apollo program and the whole thing in the 60s and 70s, the whole notion of, like you said, putting a man on the moon, that was incredible. That was monumental for those of us here in the United States. Because as we know, uh, in the 60s, uh, President Kennedy was determined that we were going to have a space program and put a man on the moon. He said we were going to do it. He didn't get a chance to live to see it. But in any event, uh, we did get it done. So that's what I'm saying. You being a part, and there's been so many different movies made about the whole space. And you had uh, uh, the you know Apollo 13 movies. You've had uh, since that time. You had the, the the movie about the women that were a part of NASA. You've had. I yep. mean, I mean, just NASA is big for those who who don't live it. And then, from what I understand, you know, in the book is your dad was actually in the uh, command center with Apollo 11 whenever they were communicating back and forth. And we'll talk about that a little bit as we get into the book. But for me, as an outsider looking in, that's a big deal. And you, and I'm sitting here listening to you just as calmly say, oh, that was just me. That's what we did. We were all kids. Our dads were engineers. Our dads were astronauts. So it's it's it was interesting to hear how calm and, and collected that, you know, hey, that was just what we did. So how did you, I mean, so as you were growing up, that, that was life for you. And as you said, as you got about, as you got older, folks started making the big deal about it. So how did now, okay, since that was your way of life, how did that shape you coming up or growing up? Well, you know, I think it's—I think it shaped me, and, and a lot of the uh, a lot of the kids who grew up uh, around the space program were shaped in the same way. The, the one thing we feel is, is sort of a uh, a responsibility to be uh, evangelist, if you will, for for the space program, and and uh, to sort of carry on the carry on the tradition, even though we're not uh, we're not directly directly involved. I'm not working for NASA. I'm not working for Lockheed Martin or SpaceX, but, but I do feel like uh, like a lot of other kids who, who, who grew up in that area that uh, we have a little bit of a of a duty to sort of uh, carry on the the mission of, of uh, advocating for for space travel and exploration. So I think there's that. Um, I think we tend to be pretty patriotic. Pretty, uh, you know, we, we we grew up with the idea that uh, our 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 moms and dads were were doing something for the country and and that it was uh, worthwhile and and uh, Despite despite the sacrifices, I mean, we lost some some good people, obviously, during the whole thing. So, so I, I'd say those were the two sort of big influences. Oh, absolutely. And interestingly enough, um, I, 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 I connect to NASA indirectly in a couple of ways. Now with you, um, one of my mentors, fraternity brother, and a man that I love, Ernest, grew up with Ron McNair. And oh, yeah. He, yeah. He, he was actually was at the, the launch or was on his way to the launch whenever uh, that horrific crash or you know explosion occurred but he and ron mcnear were boyhood friends and he has pictures of ron that he's and i have him hanging up in my office too uh so it's interesting to hear like because you said something just now about you know as you came up you were not you're not associated with nasa but were there other of your 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 playmates whose dads were in nasa engineers did they go on to to follow in their dad's footsteps you know that's a good question mark and i i think the answer is 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 not many of them did. One of the one of the kids of uh, Jerry Carr uh, joined NASA as, as a uh, as sort of a media person, like a PR person. Um, but but uh, I, I don't know of any who have become astronauts. Uh, there are a few that uh, that uh, have become engineers with various contractors. But I don't I don't know that anyone sort of directly followed in those footsteps and and, uh, and worked for NASA. I wouldn't be surprised if there uh, if there aren't. I wouldn't be surprised if there aren't a couple, um, but but I, but none are springing to mind right now. I'd say the majority of us sort of went different ways. Well, wow, that's that is interesting because I'm telling you, like for me, I'm the principal. And as a matter of fact, I hope one or two of my students are listening because I have a couple of young men who they 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 are going to get to NASA or or to be aeronautical engineer or something. And I hope he's listening. I hope this particular child is listening because I made sure I shared the information. I said you make sure tomorrow morning you get up early and you listen because this is you know I'm talking to a person who's around what it is that you want to do. So I hope Abdur is listening. But in any well, event, uh, yeah, and, and 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 Mark, you you mentioned Ron McNair, um, you know. Ron and my dad were, were, were good friends, and, and um, my dad was a, a very straight-laced, um, very smart, uh, analytical guy. He was an electrical engineer um, and, and, and was, was able to fix anything he, you know, he, he, he was presented with. He was uh, like a 
that he was he was a brilliant guy, but he was always amazed by Ron McNair because Ron McNair was not only a scientist, um, you know, an astrophysicist, he was also a, 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 a held a black belt in karate and correct played, sax, played, played the saxophone. sax right. And uh, you know, it came from a background where you know my understanding is that one time when he was a kid, he went to try to check out a book from a local library, and the library wouldn't let him. Correct. Uh, Due to, due to racial prejudice and, and uh, you know, so the, the, the police were called and that sort of thing. And Ron sort of, sort of stood his ground and eventually was able to check out the books. Uh, no, that's so, correct. You know, yeah. Now, my dad was, was real impressed with Ron and, and uh, it, was, uh, it was heartbreaking when, when he died on the, on the Challenger mission there in 86. No, that's one of those, like people always say they knew where they were when the president, when John F. Kennedy was assassinated. I know where I was when it came over the radio about Challenger. Uh, at the time, yeah. I was working at AT and T, and I was actually working as a secretary. And and it came over the radio. I had the radio on at my desk, and it came over that you know the Challenger just exploded. And I didn't think I'd heard what I'd heard. I like what What do you mean the Challenger exploded? <laughs> and, yeah. and so I know exactly. I can see it as I'm talking to you. But now something you just said that was interesting. And what in terms of your dad being very analytical, very being you know intelligent, so forth. How did that now was because you heard me in, in the opening say how I have the poster with, you know, all the, the flight deck of a 747 with all the knobs and everything. I said, if you miss one of those knobs, the, the, you know, just like we were talking about the shuttle, you know, that O-ring is what caused that to go. One tiny thing can cost lives and equipment. How did that shape in terms of how your dad raised you? Did he raise you to be very... Analytic. I mean, you're a lawyer, so obviously must have. I mean, I'll let you answer that. Was he kind of like, is that the way he influenced you? You know, the, the way he influenced me was, uh, I'm, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not mechanical at all. You know, I can, I can fix a bicycle tire and that's, that's about as far as it goes. Um, but one thing that I, that I took away from him and, and, and I'm, I'm kind of proud of it. Uh, and it was maybe his, one of his best traits. And, and that is when he, when he talked to you, um, he didn't wait for a pause in the conversation just to respond, he, he really listened, and he was, um, and he was extremely fair uh, in, in, terms of, um, in terms of analyzing and discussing any question you might have. And, and, and so I, I've, I've tried to be that way myself and avoid, um, you know, knee-jerk reactions to, 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 to things and, and to be thoughtful. Uh, and, and and open to suggestions. I, I don't know if I'm conveying that right, but he, he was a very um, he was a very fair and judicious person in terms of analyzing what people were saying to him. He, he listened, uh, and I think that's important. No, I understand exactly what you're saying, especially when we have so many people in these times who don't listen. And, you know, the the average person really do, as they say, they're not necessarily listening to take in what the other person, they are listening with trying to formulate a response. That's, that's, you know, and that's just us. That's, That's what we do. But what you were just describing, somebody saying, no, I'm not necessarily listening. I really want to hear what you have to say, and then I can respond. So, yes, that is that is a valuable skill for sure. And I, I'm, I'm just sitting here again as I'm talking to you, blown away at, at so many different things in terms of just being associated with that and then it being your norm. Because you're around, like you said, all these big names. You're around the John Glenns and, the, you know, all those folks that were that are famous now. I mean, they're, when you talk astronauts and you know astronomy and all that when you start talking in that field those are the names that come up and the movie i was trying to say earlier i, was, I just could not think of the name it was hidden figures i mean i've hidden seen figures, i've yeah. seen hidden figures i've seen apollo 13 i've seen some of the other i've seen documentaries documentaries um and so now getting a chance to talk to you um is a thrill for me i had a pilot before the pandemic i had guest speakers coming to my school one or t- once or twice a week, and so one of my guests was a United Airlines captain. And Bruce, when I tell you I was worse than the kids, I was as giddy and worse than the kids. <laughs> the fact that he came in there with the four stripes and the uniform and the hat, and he was addressing them, you know, helping them understand the career of being a pilot. But man, well, I'm telling you, I was worse than the kids. I mean, I just cannot believe I was sitting there with like an airline guy. And see, again, for those of you in the industry, you're like, this is my job, just like my job as a principal, or whatever. This is my job, so it's no big deal. But for those of us on the outside looking in, it's a big deal for us. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. So 
what? Because I, I know I, I read the titles of your other books in terms of like each one is kind of like in a different genre. Yeah. yeah. What? What? Well, I mean, so, right. So, so I think the, um, the the one thing that they have in common is that they tend to be. I mean, I've written a couple of uh, novels now that are sort of, uh, for lack of a better term, horror novels, although they're set in the in the old west, uh, Sour Lake, and in the land of dead horses. Uh, and then I wrote some uh, book of poems for middle schoolers with my daughter Carson, uh, and um, and I'm trying to <laughs> I'm trying to figure out when this is a this, like I said this is a this is a change of pace this is a, a biography slash memoir uh, nonfiction uh, and it was and frankly it was harder to write because you know the space flights there's a lot of technical data involved uh, and it, it was important to me that I get that right for the sake of of, of, of my dad, who would have wanted me to get it right, right. <laughs> uh, but 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 also because a lot of the people who are reading this book are people who are either are or were involved with the space program, uh, or people who are interested in the space program, and to them the details really matter. And and uh, I spent a lot of time trying to get those right. I, I'm not sure that I got them all right, uh, but I, but I came I came pretty close. And, and, and so that was, in, in that respect, it was harder than than writing about something that that lived in my head. Well, I, I'm sure, and that's why I mean, you kind of answered the question I was getting ready to ask. Like to make the shift from a novel to, like you said, a biography or, or a memoir. I'm that's most of my. I've been doing this 21 years now, and the bulk of my guests generally stay within one genre every now and again i'll get somebody that crossed over like you did but that is not that easy to do for the listening audience it's not that easy to do to go from writing fiction or a novel to now non-fiction and as you just said a non-fiction book that is going to be read by detail-oriented folks because again I, I declare that folks who deal with aviation nasa they, they have to be detail-oriented because as I said, if you forget one thing, if you forget the auto thrust or auto throttle, if you forget to uh, you know put your speed brakes on, if you forget, uh, lives can be lost. That's why they have checklists in aviation. Everything yeah. is done by a checklist. So I can only imagine that when writing this, yeah, you would want to be detail, uh, have them write because you're going to be uh, read by a lot of detail oriented folks. So was that kind of, and I guess the answer would be yes. Was that kind of on your mind as you were writing this? Yeah, absolutely. And, and uh, I had not only with the publisher, not only had editors for me and, and um, um, proofreaders, which, which I definitely needed, but, but I sent the manuscript to, some folks who are involved in the space program who worked with my dad, some of them, uh, and and have them read it for accuracy and for details. And and I, you know, I'm I'm glad I did because <laughs> there were some there were some mistakes, and and, uh, and and my my friends were able to uh, to correct them for me. And and so far the uh, the reaction I'm getting to the finished book is uh, I haven't I haven't had anyone say to me, hey. Uh, uh, you messed this or that detail up about uh, about space flight. So I'm so I'm really gratified by that. In fact, I've had a couple of the, uh, former astronauts read it, and, and and they liked it. So so that's uh, that's a, an important test. I did have one guy. Um, I, I talk about Buck Rogers in the book, who is this? You know, as as you know, Mark was a comic book and comic strip hero back in the 30s and 40s. Correct. Who flew around with a flew around with a jetpack and. And uh, I said that, that that strip was popular in the 20s. It was actually only introduced in 1929. So someone out there who's a Buck Rogers fan corrected me on that. So I, so I didn't get that one exactly right. But, but uh, in the grand scheme of things, if I had to get something wrong, probably something like that. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. So but I will correct you. There you go. So those of you, if you've just joined me, I hope you've been with me since six, but definitely hope you've been with me since seven, because that's that's the power hour, the seven o'clock hour there in terms of um, me having the opportunity to chat with other folks. I, I love the six and the eight o'clock hours as well. They're power in a different way with the music. However, in the seven o'clock hour, we actually get a chance to talk to someone and I'm talking to Bruce McCandless, the third. He is the son of Bruce McCandless, the second. Who is the person that's in a picture that's probably all over the place? Anytime the space program is brought up, this picture usually comes along with it because he is the gentleman 
who is in the untethered uh, space jacket packet. It looks like a chair, but um, is actually what, what is the what is the actual name of that unit? Yeah, the that, actual uh, unit is the man. It's a jet pack. The gas right. powered jet pack. That's what it is. I was looking for that word. Gas powered jet. So he he's the astronaut in the gas powered jet pack. That's not. And when we say untethered, that means there's no cord, no lines to anything. He's just kind of floating around. Well, that's my guest's dad this morning. Now, growing up in that shot, what was that? I mean, because sometimes with siblings or, or famous parents or this that and the other, it causes pressures on the siblings or the children to try to live up to whatever their parents have done or whatever their siblings have done. Was there any kind of knowing that this was your dad, knowing that this photo was him, was there any kind of pressure put on you because of that? Uh, not by my parents so much. I mean, you know, they were typical parents. They wanted me to go to school and, and, uh, and, and actually pay attention and, and do the work and, and, and do the homework. And, and they expected me to go off to college make some of myself and and uh i certainly was willing to try to do that um uh, my dad came from a, a naval family his his father was a was an admiral in the navy and his uh, two of his grandfathers were naval officers and and for him it was it was he was always going to be a naval officer and and i think he i think he hoped that i would do that go to the naval academy and, and follow his footsteps but but he also realized that that uh uh if, if if your heart's not in something, you're not going to be good at it. That's correct. Uh, that has to be the that has to be the first question you ask. Do, is this something you want? And, and, and if if in my case, if I didn't want it, uh, I wasn't going to be successful, and I wasn't going to be following his footsteps. I mean, the following his footsteps was doing something that I love and and being good at it, uh, whatever it was. Uh, and and so I think I felt that pressure. Go do something. Go do something and excel at it. Well, now, well, that's a good pressure then, because you weren't really uh, pressured to be this super successful, famous, well-known person because your dad. Now, interestingly enough, ironically enough, your dad is the one in the picture, and as you said, the man you never knew you knew. <laughs> yeah, right, that's right. So he's the well, one. Well, that's that's yeah, that's the. I mean, that, and and so, Mark, I'm glad you mentioned that. I mean, that's sort of the tagline of the book. Uh, a lot of people have seen that famous picture of him in the MMU. Uh, but of course, uh, he's got his gold uh, visor down, and, and uh, uh, so the tagline of the book is uh, "Meet the man you never knew you knew." A lot of people know that picture; they just don't know the human being behind the uh, behind the visor. Absolutely, as I shared earlier, I have this picture hanging in my office. I have a whole in my office. I have themed walls, so I have a whole <laughs> wall that's dedicated to aviation because I was a jet engine mechanic in the Air Force, and so oh, okay. I, I worked on the F fours. Uh, the J-79 engine, so I have a big picture of an F-4, and surrounding that is everything aviation. And one of the pictures that surrounds that is this same picture that's on the cover of the book of your dad in that jetpack. <laughs> and yeah. so when I got the book, that's where I said, I have that picture. Like it said, the man you never knew you knew. And so... What? Matter of fact, you know what I'm because that's on the back of the book. I'm going to read again for the listening audience the back of the book. It says it's one of the most powerful and popular images in the history of space exploration. An astronaut in a snow white space suit, untethered and seemingly floating alone in an expanse of blue. Bruce McCandless, too, is the man in that space suit and wonders all around is the thoroughly engrossing, extensively researched story of his inspiring life and groundbreaking accomplishments as told by his son. That's my guest this morning, a lawyer, poet, and novelist. McCandless, a former Navy fighter pilot, was Houston's capsule communicator, the person talking to the astronauts. At Apollo 11's, Neil Armstrong made his giant leap for mankind in 1969. He went on to ride Challenger into space and on the 10th shuttle mission and in February of 1984, sailed out untethered into low Earth orbit as he tested the gas-powered jetpack known as the Manned Maneuvering Unit, predecessor to the safety device worn by International Space Station astronauts even today. But the road to that incredible feat was not the sure bet it should have been for such an extraordinary man. Wonders all around 
takes readers on a fascinating trip inside the complicated relationship between a father and a son from two very different generations. It also takes us straight into the lifetimes and mind of a brilliant man whose courage, imagination, and tenacity propelled him and his country to their place in the forefront of space exploration history. Now, there's an interesting line in the back there where it says a complicated relationship between a father and son from two very different generations. What was what was going on there? Or what, well, or what was the compli- yeah. what's the complications that they're alluding to? Good question. So <clears throat> I think I mentioned my dad was uh, was, uh, uh, you know, came from a naval family. And, and in fact, his father was stationed uh, at, at Pearl Harbor in December of 1941 um, when the Japanese attacked. And, and my father, who was four years old at the time, actually saw the attack from wow. the family's rental house. Uh, up on a hill above the harbor. And, you know, his father, who served on the USS San Francisco, left that morning to go down to the harbor to see if he could help out. He actually got there in time to shoot at some Japanese planes passing overhead with a forty five caliber pistol. Didn't really, didn't really do much. But, 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 yeah, but he felt better about doing it. And, and, uh, um, and so he grew up in the, in the aftermath of the Righteous War, the Second World War, uh, in our struggle with uh, the communist Soviet Union, uh, as a, a very patriotic person who felt that the United States was always doing the right thing, uh, and and I didn't. I grew up at a time when we were dealing with the ramifications of, uh, of, of racial tensions, right? And, uh, Vietnam uh, during the seventies. The seventies it was a decade of. Of reckoning, it was a decade of uh, what Jimmy Carter called the national malaise. It was, it was a time when we were all sort of reconsidering whether we really were the good guys or not, and and I, and I absorbed a lot of that. And, and my dad and I didn't see eye to eye on on um, on whether the United States was always doing the right thing. And that was, you know, that was one of the issues. And of course, we had different attitudes about what you could wear and how long your hair should right. be. Right. Mean, the seventies was a great decade for that kind of conflict. And and uh, we certainly had our share of it. Oh, see, and that's what I guess that's what I was getting at earlier in terms of the personality and the mindset to do what your dad's done, especially like with the because I know the military. I was in there for nine years. <laughs> I know how military yeah. is. Uh, and as you just say, as a child coming through now and in the 70s, like you said, we were doing bell bottoms and afros and long hair and uh, the psychedelic colors and the Swedish right. nights and, and, and uh, the, the polyester shirts and the. <laughs> <laughs> I know that time the big uh, the, the platform shoes the see you taking me back to that time frame. <laughs> well, yeah. So I mean, I remember hearing the uh, the Isley Brothers doing "Fight the Power" and thinking, "Hey, man, that's uh, this, this is my generation." <laughs> <laughs> so I can see. <laughs> I could see exactly what you're saying. Yes, that would be. And at the same time, uh, I can understand why each would feel the way they felt based on when they came up. It's just the same way I am with my daughters now based on the time I came through versus when they came through. Uh, so, yeah, interesting. When, as your dad would have these experiences, like being untethered or on the or talking to, you know, being in Capcom or down in, in the headquarters whenever, you know, one small leap from America. Would he share that with you all when you came, or did you all talk about that, or were like, Dad, what was that like, or did you know what was going? That's what I'm saying. This is fascinating to me. Yeah. So he, he you know, one thing about growing up with my my, my mom and dad was that uh, we talked about space a lot, and and almost like I didn't recognize the significance of of what he'd done until I I left the whole NASA environment. I, I didn't realize how much I'd absorbed about. Space and space history, and, and until I left and 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 met people who, who really didn't know much about it at all, and 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 uh, and, and, and and like I said, realized that hey, I, I sort of absorbed a lot of this stuff, um, and and so my dad talked about it a lot. Uh, he was a he was an idea guy, so he was always talking about what was what was next, what was going to happen next, and and uh, he talked a lot about the MMU, as you might imagine. Uh, he talked a lot about development of the shuttle. We talked a lot about uh, the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, you know, when he was the Capcom for Neil and Buzz on Apollo 11, I was I was only eight, so I'm not sure I remember very much about that. Um, but but I'm sure he I'm sure he talked about it. And, and and one of the issues though was that he was not a very effusive 
man, he was, uh, you, you know, Mark, you're a, a great communicator. You, you, you're enthusiastic, uh, and you make other people enthused. My dad was a very uh, analytical person. He was he, he was used to speaking in terms of numbers and and uh, and that sort of thing. And, and he he wasn't uh, he didn't get excited about things. So if you didn't listen carefully, you were going to miss you were going to miss something, and, and uh, <laughs> he wasn't going to repeat it. <laughs> so you had to be uh, you know you, you had to be you had to be paying attention. And 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 uh, to my regret, I you know as a kid, I wasn't always paying attention. So. Well, I, and understandably so, as children. Right? Because, I, again, that was that was your normal everyday day life. Like I said, for me, I'm looking at it from like like jaw dropped because of something that's so amazing, something that's so unique, something that's so different, and something that was so big, as you said, for the country and the world. Because as you know, we were we were always you know the Cold War was going on. We was always in the race with uh, the Soviet Union as to who was going to get folks in space first, and all that. so it was a big deal. And and to be talking to somebody that was a part of that big deal, not to mention the history that you just said in terms of Pearl Harbor and your grandparents and so. On. I mean, you're just full chocked with history, as they say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I I actually start the book talking about. Um, I guess the first chapter is actually about a road trip we all took, but I, I start the second chapter at least talking about uh, how my uh, an ancestor of mine, Dave McCann, was in Nebraska, was was involved in, uh, in Wild Bill Hickok's first gunfight. In fact, uh, he was he was gunned down by Hickok, and what the Hickok folks always call the righteous, uh, 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 you know, duel, and, and McCann's partisans have always claimed was a murder. Uh, and and historians now agree with the McCandlesses that Hickok uh, gunned down my ancestor Dave McCandless in cold blood, and that led to the family that 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 murder led to the family leaving for Colorado and and uh, starting a whole sort of new chapter in, in, in the clan history. And, and uh, who knows, history might have been different if it hadn't been for that run. <laughs> that, that, that's right. Wild Bill. Yeah. That that's right, and so <laughs> again, and and again, working the school that I lead is a single gender school, is all males, and we do a lot of work in terms of helping them understanding their ancestry. Uh, my school is an academy; it's a leadership academy, so we get a chance to do things a little bit different from some of the other schools within the district. And so, part of that difference is the focus that we have on ancestry. So the fact that I just heard you bring up now that you've done the research into your and that's a wonderful thing and to be able to trace it back. But as I said, just chocked full of history. Listening audience, again, my guest this morning, wonderful book. His book is Wonders All Around, the incredible true story of astronaut Bruce McCandless II and the first untethered flight in space. And my guest is Bruce McCandless III. I'm going back to the book again. It opens with a quote from the late Senator John S. McCain. This is from Senator McCain. This is from now. We all know John McCain. We all know John McCain. He actually ran for president at, at one point. Um, you know, he has this big controversy that was going on between him and President Trump. And so we know John McCain. Bruce McCandless and I were both members of the class of 1958 at the United States Naval Academy. As an undistinguished graduate of that class, I always looked up to Bruce, not only for his incredible intellect, but also for his character and integrity, which embodied the highest values of the United States Navy. The iconic photo of Bruce soaring effortlessly in space has inspired generations of Americans to believe that there is no limit to human potential. That's quote unquote Senator John S. McCain. So again, we're these are f- famous folks. And again, I'm it's not like I get starstruck, but at the same time, I am always honored, humbled, and and privileged to be associated with folks who know the famous. And see, you open up a book with Senator John McCain, and, and not to mention, so your dad graduated with John McCain. Yeah, they they um, they went to the Naval Academy together, as as, as John McCain himself always uh, freely acknowledged. He he was not a particularly good student, um, and uh, almost almost got kicked out a couple times because he wasn't particularly uh, uh, you know he didn't behave himself uh, <laughs> the way uh, midshipmen were supposed to. My dad was on the other end of the spectrum. He was. Uh, he was very well behaved, uh, and and uh, at the top of his class. In fact, he was only beaten out um, uh, for the number one spot in that class by a fellow you may also know uh, by the name of John Poindexter, who went on to become Ronald Reagan's national security advisor. Okay, all right. Uh, yeah, 
and and so so but but uh, despite the differences in their class rank, I mean they were they were both great officers. My dad and and, uh, and McCain and and Poindexter for that matter, and and my dad and and John McCain both served as fighter pilots on the USS Forrestal, and um, and they would occasionally come back to Virginia Beach uh, when the, when the carrier came back from the Mediterranean. Uh, and because their names were so similar, sometimes my mom uh, would get uh, the, the ship would, would would do the officers' laundry, and they'd send the laundry home with the guys. And uh, sometimes we would get uh, John McCain's laundry, and my mom delighted in uh, in, in the fact that uh, she could go up to John McCain at parties. <laughs> John McCain was a John McCain was a real ladies' man. Whenever he was talking to an attractive <laughs> woman. Uh, my mom would go up and say, "Hey, Johnny, uh, I've still got a pair of your underwear at my house." And, and, uh, <laughs> well, that's humbling. <laughs> yeah, uh, and, and uh, that would raise some eyebrows, and, and she never got tired of that joke. <laughs> I am sure. Now, again, de- anytime you're dealing with aviation, and, and then space is even up another notch. You're talking a certain amount of danger that's involved because you never know on any particular mission, on any flight or what have you, what could go wrong uh, or whether or not you're going to come back alive. What, how much of a factor was that in? I mean, were you all like when dad was going up, were you afraid that dad might come back or, or was your mom afraid that her husband might not come back or kind of did that play in at all? Yeah. So by the time my dad went up, he he. he He'd been in at NASA for 18 years, and, and, and a lot of the books about the fact that uh, his career got sidetracked somewhere along the way, and he had to work really hard to get back into the good graces of, of the NASA bureaucracy. So by the time he finally got his flight, I was uh, actually in grad school um, over at the uh, University of Reading in England, and uh, I didn't even get to see it. I, I saw I saw him when he was doing his uh, his free flight in the MMU. Um, but I, I, I wasn't particularly worried about him. I mean, my, my dad was a fearless guy uh, and, and always seemed to be in control of things, and, and uh, it, it, it never occurred to me that he was, that he was mortal and, and capable of being, being injured. And, of course, at that time, you know, the Challenger explosion hadn't happened and we hadn't lost the Columbia orbiter either, so, so people were a little bit complacent, I think, about, about the safety of the, uh, of the shuttle. But... Um, my mom felt completely different. I mean, she was a nervous wreck, uh, as a lot of the, you know, as, as, as you would be, as a lot of the wives were, and, and I'm sure some of the husbands of the female astronauts are. It's, it's, it's tough to see a loved one, uh, you know, ride that controlled explosion up into the, up into the cosmos. Right. You know, but, dis- but see, again, I think that's what has the mystique around this type of work, because it is dangerous, and yet you have folks with the courage who are willing to put their life on the line for something bigger than them. Yeah. I mean, you know, my dad always said, Hey, um, I'm, I'm not, I'm not scared of space flight. And the reason why is because I used to fly the Phantom, the F4, uh, off and back on to aircraft carriers at night (laughs) in in weather. Oh my God. If you can, if you can, if you can land the flying brick uh, on an aircraft carrier, (laughs) At night, you know, you, that, that, uh, you can do all kinds of things. You know, and I'm going to tell you what, I could not agree with him more. The, the Phantom is the bird that I worked on whenever I was in the Air Force. Um, again, like I said, the, the J-79 engine, uh, it was the F-4. I love the F-4. I, don't think, I mean, we were supposed to convert to F-16s. We didn't, and we kept the F-4. Actually, we converted to KC-135s. But I always and still love the F-4 because that was my first bird. But, I, you know, I'm on Flight Simulator, and, and it gives you the opportunity to program exactly what you just described, the night landing on an aircraft carrier. To this minute, I don't... First off, I have a hard time landing on it in the day, <laughs> let alone trying to land on it at night when it's pitch black. It literally is like, they always say, it's like trying to land on a postage stamp. That's moving. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And it really, I mean, when you, so I, I could not agree with him more that if you can do that, you really can do just about anything. If you can come to, I mean, Top Gun is my all time favorite movie. And that's one of the first things in the movie whenever he's just trying to get the pilot down onto the, onto the, the, the um, carrier and he loses yeah. it. You know, he kind of loses his, his bearings and everything else and just drops out. But, but I mean, no. So I, I have to agree with your dad there. So I guess, I guess. You know, sailing in space would would could be secondary. <laughs> <laughs> Hard to believe, but yeah. yeah. 
but to the listening yeah, audience, it, like it, like you can, you have not. I have the. I, I mean, I have the utmost respect for pilots anyway. But for the for the fighter pilots who are able to get down on an aircraft carrier, because this is a, a ship that is moving and bobbing up and down on the water, um, and you have to get your plane out of the air down on that, and you have to do it in a certain way. It's not it's it's not like a traditional landing at an airport. There's a certain way you have to come in on that carrier for that tail hook to catch. Uh, and if you don't, if it misses, you either have to go around again or you're into the ocean. So, and now you're talking about doing that at night. So, you know, I'm not going to be the dead horse on it, but, but I understand exactly where your dad was coming from when he said that. Yeah. Yeah. Mark. <laughs> so there, there's a, there's a, uh, a, there's a, a portion of the book where I talk about the fact that, uh, this is not when he was flying the F-4. I think he was flying the A-4 at this point, but he came in uh, for a landing um, uh, on the forestall, and, and something happened, and the, uh, the, the arresting wire basically uh, tore off a, a piece of the rear end of his plane and didn't stop him. Oh. Um, so, he, so there he is, you know, sort of the pilot's nightmare. He, he, he's on the deck of the, of the carrier, still moving, uh, you know, he, he hasn't been stopped, but he doesn't have enough speed at this point to get back up. So he does the only thing he can do, and that is, you know, engage the afterburner, uh, manages to get the, the, the plane back off the deck. I think the A-4 was, was really known for its climbing ability. So right. he, was, he was able to get up very high, very fast, and, and as he was doing so, the uh, the tower back in um, on the forestall told him, you're, you know, you're on fire. Your plane's on fire. And, and he looked back, and sure enough, there was a plane of about a 50-foot plume of uh, Flame coming out the back of the plane, um, and so he had he had to ditch the plane and, and uh, eject and, and uh, you know have the helicopter come out and get him the right. classic uh, rescue scenario, and uh, and and that stuck with him. I mean, he he wouldn't talk about it very much. In fact, it was only when I I went through his files after he died and found the uh, I actually found the incident report, <laughs> the official report, right, of uh, uh, the Navy file, and was able to learn a little bit more about that uh, about that accident. Um, you know, the accident was bad enough, but then he had to put up with the Navy investigating the next Correct. Trying to figure out if it was his fault or not. And they, That's they right. Determined it was, yeah, it was, it was a material failure in the, in the plane, and it wasn't pilot error. So, No, uh, you're absolutely right. And for those of you, and again, if you're an AV geek listening to this interview, then you're in your glory just like I am. And if you're not, it's kind of like, it's a great story, but if you're not into aviation, some of the stuff may not connect. But for those of us who are in aviation or AV geeks, everything that Bruce is saying, you understand. And then if you've ever seen the movie Top Gun, there's that scene in there where Tom Cruise, where he has to come in in his dress whites, and he's in front of the, the board. Where they, again, just as Bruce just said, they're trying to figure out what caused that. And I tell, and I, interestingly enough, I had this conversation with students again the other day. I was a jet engine mechanic. We had to sign off on everything that we did. And I said, and if, if, God forbid, a plane were to crash, they would look at those engines and say, who was the last one worked on these engines? They can, yeah. they can track that all the way back. They're like, who, who, who had anything to do with maintenance on this engine? We had to sign off whenever, whatever repairs we made. So, again, yes, you do can come under investigation and understand exactly what you're saying. As we were talking a couple of minutes ago about cross genre whether it was the poetry book or the novels and now this book what did this book do since you were writing it about your dad did this book do anything for you in terms of reflection or being cathartic or just bringing out like did or was it a release or was it just you know this is a tribute to my dad what was writing this book like oh uh, for you yeah well that's a great question i'm not sure anyone's asked me that actually and it was uh i think it was a lot of things. I mean, my mom and dad were old school. They didn't. They didn't. They, they didn't talk a lot about their feelings, uh, and, and they didn't. Uh, they, they were tough to get to sometimes emotionally. Um, right. I, I don't know what your parents are like, but uh, their their deal was: we work hard, uh, we sacrifice so you can have a better life, um, and go 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 have that life. And, and uh, uh, we're not going to complain about stuff that we might have given up. Um, cause we did it for y'all. Correct. And, 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 and so it, it, it was a chance to, to, uh, to think about a lot of things and, and, uh, to reconcile my, myself to, a, to a lot of, uh, things that happened in life and, and maybe say some things that I hadn't had a chance to do, had a chance to say while my parents were both alive. And so, so it was, uh, maybe it was partly therapy and maybe it was, uh, 
probably a tribute to my mom and dad. I, I call it at one point a, a belated love letter uh, to my parents, um, and I, I, because I think my uh, my respect for them comes through. Uh, and you know, and I have to say, I I really at some point I really just enjoyed writing about space. I mean, I, th- I thought it was a huge kick. I mean, once I sort of got engaged with it, um, I, I really enjoyed that, and I've, I've I've since enjoyed learning about uh, you know what's what might be next, and, and uh, uh, I've engaged, oh, uh, let me mention this, I've engaged through Facebook with a, uh, a, a really great group of people called the Space Hipsters. Uh, <laughs> okay. If, 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 uh, if you're into social media at all, I'd, I'd encourage you to join the Space Hipsters group. Oh, I will. Before When I get home, yeah. I'll go right to Space Hipsters. That's easy to remember. <laughs> yeah, we, we talk about everything having to do with space, you know, uh, from, from rocket design to... Uh, to you know, what kind of spacesuits people are wearing? To what William Shatner said when he came back to Earth the other day, and uh, <laughs> uh, so, so so it's a great question. I think there was a uh, there was a bunch of stuff involved in, in writing the book, but but certainly catharsis and and uh, in dealing with grief was was one of the one of the good things about it. Well, again, I, I think it's a fantastic tribute. Uh, to a fantastic life. And, and again, I, I, I get a kick out of your tag, tagline because it is so true. And now I know who it is. So now I, when, people come in, when people come into my office now, I can say, I know the name of the person in this photo. The man you never knew you knew. And I, I'm looking here at the, at the contents here. Um, the chapters are this. And listening audience, you know. I mean, it's not like we're necessary. We, we can't force anybody to buy, but we can recommend. And, and for those of you who listen and you go out and purchase books or you order books, the title of the book is Wonders All Around, the incredible true story of astronaut Bruce McCandless II and the first untethered flight in space. The author is Bruce McCandless III. Now, these are, these are the chapter titles, The Long Drive, Bathed in Blood, The Boy with Two Brains, You Are on Fire. Don't treat him as a pilot. You'll get used to the heat. Try staying home. Voluntary com- complacence. Complacence, excuse me. Voluntary yeah, yeah. complacence. Appalachians up above. The temporary anarchist. The forgotten astronaut. The loon. Buck Rogers. Ah, that's the Buck Rogers. Set. Buck Rogers and the silver bird. The accidental icon. Intermission. Launching the time machine. Eye in yep. the sky, a new start, king of terrors, the unthinkable, another funeral, the true believer. Those are the chapters that are part of the book. How did you come up with the title, Wonders All Around? Because it has, I mean, I'm big on, I'm a wordsmith and I'm big on titles. I see multiple meanings here. So what are your yeah. thoughts in terms of how did you come up with Wonders All Around? Well, okay, another, another good one, Mark. You, 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 got, you got the good question this morning. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I started out, so, so my dad, when he, my dad at the, at the very end of his life, he, he resisted the idea of writing a, a memoir for, for many years. But at the very end of his life, he decided he wanted to do it, and, and he'd sort of gotten started, and he'd come up with a title, uh, but he died before he could really, before he could get much work done. And so I sort of decided I'd write it for him, but the title, the title he came up with was Untethered, uh, which is which is good and kind of catchy. But but really, I mean, he wasn't an untethered person, generally right. speaking. Uh, un- he was a very he was the most tethered person I know. I mean, he was a very dutiful, uh, you know, uh, honorable, duty bound uh, person. He was he was he was chained to his own family legacy in a way. Uh, and to the precepts he absorbed at the Naval Academy about being an officer and a gentleman. Uh, so I didn't think that was really the best title, and I, I thought I'd go with the Fearless, which captured some aspects of his personality because he really was. I mean, he, I never saw him show any uh, any fear about anything. But he was he was more than that too. He was a multifaceted person who who loved animals. He and my my mom were uh, wildlife rehabilitation folks. They raised injured birds and other animals for many years. He was president of the Houston Audubon Society back in the 70s, uh, and, and sort of, sort of an, an early environmental advocate in the Houston area back then, which was not a very popular thing to be, you know, in the energy capital of the, of the world. Uh, right. And he was fascinated with so many things, geology and weather and, and history, and, and, uh, and, and so I tried to think, and look at look at the world through his eyes, 
and, and, and describe it in terms of all the uh, all the marvelous things there are to think about and experience and encounter uh, in the world, and, and to do it with a brain like my dad had, uh, I think must have been a, a tremendous experience. Wow. Uh, so I just joined Space. Is that hipsters with one P? Because there's two. There's a H-I-P-P stirs and there's Space Hipsters, H-I-P-S-T-E-R-S. Yeah, I think it's just with the one P. I don't know okay. who, they, who the two P's so, are. <laughs> yeah, this, and maybe that was just Facebook bringing up the spot. I don't know. It says founded in 2011 by Emily Carney. Yeah, that's space, right. Okay, Space Hipsters is a worldwide community that celebrates the past, present, and future of space. Well, I just joined it. <laughs> just joined, so I am now uh, on this, in the Facebook group of Space Hipsters. The other day, the same student that I hope is, is tuning in, he came to me and, and gave me the Mars website of where I can have my name sent to Mars. So oh, I, went, nice. I went on that site and, and, and put my name in there, and supposedly in 2026, my name is going to be sent to Mars. <laughs> Excellent, yeah. yeah. So I uh, just joined Space Hipsters 2026. My name will be going to Mars. So, you know, like I said, AV Geek, we take every opportunity that we get. <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a proud Space Hipster, and, and, and you'll, you'll meet, there are lots of them around. You can, you, it's fun to meet them and, and talk space. There's never a, never a bad time to talk about space, we say. I, I agree. And, and now we have a whole Space Force. Under the Trump administration, the Space Force came to fruition. And because because I know they were they were figuring out or they figured out what their uniforms are going to look like and so forth uh, and their mission. And so now we have what they call like we have the Air Force, like we have the, uh, you know, you have the Navy, you have the Army, you have the Marines, the Coast Guard. Now we have the Space Force as well. Uh, so, yeah, yeah. so, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's un- unclear exactly uh, what they'll be doing. But one thing they'll be doing is sort of protecting our, our satellites and and. Uh, and spacecraft from espionage and that sort of thing by by the bad guys in the world, uh, whoever they may be at the moment. So correct. I, I heard you talking a couple of minutes ago about William Shatner. What do you think about uh, Jeff Bezos and and Tesla and and um, my, my my own from Virgin Atlantic, Richard and all of them, yeah. uh, Richard Branson. What do you think about their thoughts in terms of us? You know, one day we might be able to go back and forth just like we do within the country. Yeah, I think it's uh, you know it, it's it's easy to sort of make fun of those guys. Uh, as, as I think uh, Prince William did recently, saying, "Hey, you need to be focused on on uh, making the Earth a better place." And, and and I understand where that's coming from. Uh, it can seem a little frivolous that we're doing that. That guys like Bezos and Branson are doing these little short hop tourist flights, like amusement park rides. But but that's how it starts. I mean, you know, you got to start somewhere. And, right. And, uh, I think Branson and Bezos, and and of course Elon Musk. Uh, who's accomplished a little bit more than those two guys? Right, uh, are all have their have their have their hearts in the right place. I mean, they want to make space accessible and something that we uh, that that everyone can can get up into and and, uh, and and make it part of our lives. And and so I'm 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 good with it. And I think my dad would have been too. He was eager to see uh, you know private industry get involved in uh, in, in, in space enterprise. So. So, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, good for William Shatner. He's a 90-year-old guy gets to go into space. So, you know, <laughs> right. That's right. So, uh, again, listening audience, we've been listening to. And interestingly, I meant to say this a little bit earlier, because you know how they say um, pilots, you all have like this certain voice. Even though I know you were not an astronaut, you're not an astronaut, but you do have that pilot voice. Because they say after Chuck Yeager, all the pilots yeah. started sounding alike in terms of how they come over on the PA system and how they communicate back and forth with the control tower. And you have that voice as well. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, I think that's good. One, that's, that's, uh, there are worse voices to have, I guess. <laughs> This is true, but my guest this morning is Bruce McCandless the third. The book is about his dad, Bruce McCandless the second, and we are now at the point, Bruce, where I turn off my microphone and, and let you promote in terms of book signings, uh, any other new work, anything you want the listening audience to know. The only thing you can't say is the cost or price. Um, those oh, okay. things, once folks get in touch with you, you all work that out and negotiate that on your own. But anything short of the cost or price of services or books or whatever, anything short of that. I'm going to turn the mic off, and it's yours. Okay. Well, thank you, Mark. And, and before I uh, before I do that, I just want to mention uh, my mother is a, uh, a New Jersey girl. She grew up in Roselle uh, okay. and, and uh, near Newark and actually went to school with uh, football great Rosie Greer. 
Okay. Uh, and and uh, although she died in 2014, I'm sure she'd want to say hello. She'd want me to say hello to, to everyone there in New Jersey. She was always very proud of being from from Jersey. Um, but the book, yeah, wonders all around. It's uh, available pretty much wherever you uh, you know wherever books are sold. You can get it online through Amazon and Barnes and Noble, and, and you can get it uh, at a number of uh, local booksellers. Sometimes you might have to order it, but uh, some of them have it in stock. Some of the Barnes and Nobles in particular have it in stock. Uh, if you're interested in space and interested in American history and sort of the culture of the 60s and 70s, I think you might like it. Uh, and and uh, so I'd sure appreciate it if you pick up a copy. All right. Well, I thank you for rising early because Bruce is in Central Time. And we are on Eastern Time. So that means whatever time it is here, it is an hour behind there. So when we started the interview at 7 o'clock this morning, our time, it was 6 o'clock in the morning, his time. <laughs> so, <It sure> was. <laughs> so I am grateful and thankful that you took the time to rise early to join us. Fascinating interview. I had an absolute blast. I mean, just, yeah, the, I did too. You, just the, the great question today, Mark. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you. And I appreciate you and your family and everything that your father and, and your family in general has contributed to the country and the world. I mean, I mean, again, I, I, I don't know too many people that I can say his dad's pictures, you know, just about everywhere you go, especially when you start talking space exploration. <laughs> so yeah. Uh, yeah. and you're like I said, your dad's hanging in my office at, at my office at the school is hanging in there. Uh, so now it'll be a, a teachable moment when when my students come to the office, I can now get into the history of your dad. Yeah, very good. Well, I hope I hope some of them are interested in uh, in my dad, and more more importantly, in, in space history, and 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 even more important than that, the future. Space there you history. go. So, all right, Bruce, thank you so much. Uh, I do record the show; it will be on my YouTube archives. I'll send you or either Shannon the links in terms of you know you can take them and do whatever you want with them in terms of websites or share it out or what have you. But once I send them to you, they're yours. Okay, very good. All right. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful day and say, you know, give vested family and everybody. But thank you so much. Yeah, thank you very much, Mark. I appreciate you having me on. All right. Take care. Take care. Man. Thank Bye. you. All right. That is another episode of The Reading Circle with Mark Medley. Needless.